<laughs> I'm interviewing Arjun Makajani, who's a plasma physicist and the president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Now, we've got 15 minutes left, Arjun. I want to get into Fukushima. Please, would you go, give us your latest understanding of what is happening there and your prognostication for the future? Well, you know, fortunately, the, the major releases have stopped. I mean, they've still got some problems of, you know, cooling the reactors and the debris. Uh, the biggest sort of threat for the future currently is generally recognized to be the spent fuel pool in reactor number four, where there's the most fuel of any reactor that was damaged. Uh, and the uh, reactor core had been unloaded lo- into the pool not long before the accident in March 2011. Uh, the structure has been weakened, so people are afraid if there's another earthquake, there could be sort of a complete breakdown of that pool, and you could have a fire and dispersal of quite a large amount of radioactivity. I mean, the inventory of, of cesium in that is... is is the total inventory of cesium in that pool, by my calculation, is somewhat more than the inventory of cesium that was released in the atmosphere from all atmospheric nuclear weapons testing. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, so it's very, very large. At the same time, you know, uh, I mean, Japan would really, there would be a, a bigger catastrophe in Japan if there were a very large fire in that spent fuel pool. Yes. So I think, I think the main task now, of course, it's impossible to approach that spent fuel pool. Because it's because, very hot. But not only very hot, but because of the hydrogen explosion, the cranes that normally handle this stuff remotely have mm. been destroyed. Yeah. And so there's no fuel handling. There's no fuel handling machinery in three of these four reactors. Yeah. So it, it's um, very difficult to see how they're going to. I mean, approaching the spent the spent fuel, uh, it has lethal levels of radioactivity. Yeah. So they, but they do have to act with some dispatch to try to get that fuel out of the pool into some better configuration. They have a common pool at the Fukushima site uh, in which they could put it, or they, they, I don't think all of that can be put into dry storage yet. Some of it, I think, is still too hot. Um, So they have, that I think is the biggest problem on the site. Then they've got all this contaminated water, uh, you know, they've got the contaminated ocean, but the larger problem that is looming is how to think about the contaminated zone, the contaminated food, how to think about repopulation, whether to think about resettlement of some of these areas, what about the children and the radiation doses in the schools. It doesn't really help to say that the risks are lower than natural, vac- um, you know, than, than natural no, uh, occurrences of cancer. It doesn't help. It's a lie. Uh, and as you know, I'm very, very sober and careful about these numbers, but I've thought about this in a kind of a new perspective, mm. thinking about the anguish as a parent, you know. Yes. And and I thought, okay, I I personally actually would be ready to go to help as a professional matter, you know, if I were in a position to make a significant contribution. You know, I'm 67. Okay. But if I lived there, would I send my children to a contaminated school and 30 years later one of them got cancer and the chances are the cancer would not be due to the contamination but would I ever forgive myself because there's a non-zero chance that it could be due to the contamination I don't think I could ever forgive myself I don't think any parent could forgive themselves and so the dilemma isn't just in the levels of radiation the dilemma is that you're increasing the risk for your kids, and if they, if something untoward were to happen, you could never live with yourself. And so knowing that down the road, what do you do? Do you abandon your ancestral homes? Do you abandon your communities? Do you abandon your farms or businesses? Or do you kind of step into this very uncertain, anguished, and of course, you know, people have poo-pooed psychological stresses around nuclear react- reactors. I think it's time that our community took these things very seriously mm. because we know more about stress now. 
Mm. Stress is a physical, biological thing. And this thing is producing terrible stresses in the population. Mm. Makes us vulnerable to all kinds of diseases. Goodness, we don't sleep well for a few days. We become more vulnerable to a cold. And and I I think the the problem, the direct and indirect social, economic, and political costs of Fukushima are going to be huge. And the only way I think we can actually learn some lessons, starting with Japan, and I recently wrote an op-ed in Japan, which was just published a few days ago in English and in Japanese, uh, about you know, really making the bold decision to keep all those reactors closed. Yeah. Japan is currently doing without those 54 reactors, yeah. and they have to think, are we going to kind of do air conditioning, or are we going to and do you know, contaminated schools, or are we going to find some other way? If they did what Germany did in December 2011, install three gigawatts of solar PV, if they did that in every month, you know, by next summer they'd be not, they'd still have a deficit, but they wouldn't be hurting mm. very badly. The, the, I wrote the op-ed on a very important nuclear date, which very few people know, and um, it May 5th, 1943, when Japanese forces were first targeted with a bomb. And by some cosmic coincidence, all the reactors in Japan were closed. The last one was shot on May 5th, 2012, Fancy that. Fancy that. which caused uh, a reflection on my part yes. that maybe they should turn this tragic date from 43 into a sort of a new beginning in yes. 2012. Yes. So, Arjun Makijani, you're an engineer. How would right. you, and say you were the boss and you had endless amounts of money and access to the world's best engineers, builders and the like, what would you do with building four now and the spent fuel pool number four? What would you do? Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a shoot from the hip engineer. Um, I, I do think the task is very clear. Um, you know, they have to figure out some remote, you know, obviously some mobile crane that will be able to grasp this fuel. The, the question is, you know, they have to have a container up there, too, so they can move it underwater. And then they have to figure out how they're going to transfer it, oh boy. presumably, to this common pool that they have on site. At least some of that fuel will be, have to transfer, be transferred into a pool because it's too hot for dry storage. But I, I'm pretty sure that they know that, that these are the kind of steps that are involved. Um, but, you know, not having studied the details mm. uh, more carefully, I, I wouldn't want to be advising uh, advising people. But I, I, I think, you know, the Japanese have lots and lots of excellent engineers, and I think they should be bringing some of their very, very best talent urgently to bear on this problem. Whether they are or not is a different question. And during the discussion, you talked about the graphite moderating rods that were also in Chernobyl, and they burnt, and that was the f fire that burnt ferociously for 10 days, lofting huge amounts right. of I isotopes right. in the air. But I hadn't thought about that before, but of course the graphite rods were full of carbon-14 as well, weren't they? Yeah, they weren't graphite rods. It's a big graphite block with oh, holes block. in it for the fuel yeah. and the coolant. And one of the advantages of the thorium reactor is, unlike Chernobyl, where the fuel was inside, you know, and remained inside the reactor when the fire was going, and so the the intensely hot fire was dispersed radioactive materials quite high into the atmosphere, yes. and then it wound up all over the world. In this particular reactor, the reactor itself would would be empty of the molten salt, uh, and so the the consequences of of fire would be would be orders of magnitude less than yes. Chernobyl. I yes. mean, they would be serious, but, but they would. You, they, but they you would brought be up the carbon fourteen yourself. And, yes, I did. And its yes. half life is again. What is it? Carbon fourteen half life. Carbon fourteen is five thousand seven hundred and odd. Yes, years. so, so you it's very long. Multiply that by ten, you know. And carbon, of course, is ubiquitous in the biological cycle. Um, right. And the big problem with carbon is that it gets into plants. It'll get into your DNA. Humans. It'll get into your babies. You know, exactly. irradiate in your duro, and it stays around. So the same carbon fourteen will irradiate people 
for untold generations, for 50,000 years. Is it a beta and gamma or just beta? It is a beta emitter. Yeah. I don't believe it has a no, I don't significant think it does. But gamma be, component. Beta emitters are pretty nasty because they most of the energy... As an internal emitter, it would be pretty nasty. Yeah, well, um, therefore, as an it's... external emitter, not so much. No, no, of course, but we're only talking about internal emitters now, and uh, you know, it's almost certainly all over Europe. And when I talk about Europe, and you know, forty percent is contaminated with cesium one three seven argent. Right, um, right. I is. forget about carbon fourteen, or yeah, actually, you know, carbon fourteen has no gamma radiation. No, it doesn't. It You've just looked it up, beta. haven't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have looked it up. I had my. A nuclear periodic table open for this conversation. <laughs> There's another question I've got too, which is the beryllium. I want to get back. Beryllium is not normally radioactive, so when you put no, it in no. a reactor to be used as a sort of construction material for the reactor, it, that's when it becomes radioactive and becomes a neutron emitter, right? No, no, no. Normal beryllium, uh, beryllium doesn't emit neutrons. Uh, oh, even when beryllium absorbs neutrons, it'll become beryllium-10, which is a beta emitter, like oh. carbon-14. I thought you beryllium, said it emitted Normal neutron. beryllium yeah. will emit a neutron when it is bombarded by an alpha particle. Oh. So the way they made neutron generators initially was with polonium and beryllium. So polonium has a half-life of 82 days or something, so it's a very intense alpha emitter. Right. And when the alpha particles bombard the nucleus of the beryllium, uh, uh, oh. then uh, the energy from the alpha particle uh, dislodges a neutron from the beryllium nucleus. And, and so essentially you get a neutron generator when you combine an alpha emitter with normal non-radioactive beryllium. Well, why do they put beryllium in a thorium reactor in the first place? You know, I have to, in order to give you a good answer, I have to do a little more. You have to look it up. Uh, I, I suspect it has something to do with the neutron economy of the reactor, but I, I am oh. not 100% sure. Okay. The other thing is, that as you talk, polonium, of course, is that nasty stuff that killed Litvinenko, that Russian man who was taking tea in Claridge's in the hotel in London, and <laughs> yeah. someone dropped yeah. a little tiny bit of polonium in his yeah. tea, and he died within, a, I don't know, 10 days of it's acute radiation. It's extremely illness. dangerous material because it has a very short half-life, and as a rule of thumb, the shorter the half-life, the, more, the more radioactive a given quantity is, so... 82 days, you know, it's, um, what, less than a fourth of a year, and plutonium is 24,000 yeah. years, so you can see it's a hundred and odd thousand it's times. A, it's a great It's poison. about a hundred thousand times more radioactive than plutonium. And almost certainly uh, there have been, been letters in the New England Journal of Medicine, Arjun, saying that polonium is a naturally occurring element, which is one of the daughters of uranium decay. It is. It and is. it tends to concentrate on the trichromes, which the little tiny hairs on the back of tobacco leaves. Right, so that is when... true. There was a, a very famous, very well-known researcher in Colorado who first pointed that out. In yeah, the and so when the tobacco is compressed in a cigarette and you smoke, the right. polonium tends to deposit at the bifurcations of the air passages where there is more turbulence as the air is sort of tur uh, going down into the bronchi and it tends to deposit in the mucosa at the bifurcations and that is very strongly uh, thought to be a cause of lung cancer from smoking. In fact, that may be right. the main ingredient that induces um, lung cancer from smoking. So it's, uh, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, polonium and beryllium are an are, uh, unhappy combination because That's... beryllium is actually pretty toxic also. The other interesting thing is, is thorium a daughter or part of the decay chain of uranium or is it a different? That's a different thorium. The the decay chain of uranium-238 contains thorium-230. Uh, the material that we've been talking about for reactors is thorium-232, which, like uranium, is a primordial uh, material. That is, uh, the Earth came with it. Oh, and, and so it has its own decay chain, the thorium-232. It has its own decay chain. I must exactly. look that up today and see what it decays into. 
Right. Because you well, were... it decays and it has a radium component and another thorium component. Yeah. And it has its own radon and radon decay product. Right. Right. Uh, so uranium, as you know, decays into thorium and radium and radon, and then polonium is a decay product That's of radon. Right. So there's a, there's a similar decay chain with thorium-232. Well, Arjun, thank you so much. I now understand thorium reactors much better, and when I'm about to debate with some really nasty pro-nuclear people in Adelaide shortly in South Australia and they're all keen about thorium, I know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're probably thoughtful people thinking thinking that they have a good answer to our problem, but, I, you know, in my view and yours, uh, uh, not right, but not necessarily nasty, at least. That well, nasty. I debated this guy, Richard Martin, yeah. uh, on Science Friday, and he was a very reasonable... Well, I say panel, nasty you know, because I'm a doctor and I don't like people dying of cancer. <laughs> and any, anyone that propagates cancer for me is a nasty person, I have to say. All right, Helen. Yeah. Okay. Okay, lovey. Thanks so much, Thank you. Arjun. Thank and, you. And, great to talk to you. Yeah, great to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. My guest today was Dr. Arjun Makajani, President of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Washington, D.C. His website is IEER. Dot org, And if you go to that website, you can download Carbon Free Nuclear Free, which is the roadmap for survival in a nuclear and carbon age. Um, we can prevent global warming and we can shut down all the reactors by probably 2030 now using the principles that Arjun enunciated in Carbon Free Nuclear Free. Thanks so much for listening uh, today. And we'll be back with you again with another absolutely fascinating program next week. Bye for now.